Ladies and gentlemen, we're here. A part of the click, isn't everybody? <laughs> yes! 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 I, I got an idea. Yeah. Pete and John Cena! Give me a hell yeah! I pull a little bit of the bubbly. Two. Sweet! following episode is scheduled for one fall, and it is for your listening pleasure. This is In The Click. What's up, everybody? Baby Huey here, and joining me once again is my good brother from the Bullet Cast. It's Philip. How's it going, man? Huey, it's Monday. <laughs> um, this is different. This is different for us. Yeah. Um, you know what, baby Huey? Somebody, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell okay. you a story real quick. Um, I had, I had a pretty decent weekend. I saw you in person for the first time in forever. Can we celebrate just that alone? That you and I got to hang out in person. We yeah, got to hug each, hug each other out. <laughs> it, 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 I wanted a longer embrace, baby Huey. I wanted to. I, I wanted to. I wanted to really, you know, get get the full embrace of enjoy the it. longest reigning United Kingdom champion, the longest reigning champion in WWE's modern era, NXT you. UK champion, me. Yeah, it's absolutely. 800 plus date, 801, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. No, I appreciate you honoring me and paying tribute and acknowledging me on social media. I really do appreciate that. Yeah, man, because like some <laughs> some page was like, Walter, I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not who that is. But yeah, man, I mean, so somebody tried to question the integrity of, of my crew on, on the Bullet Cast, and I had mm. to let them know. You know, th- th- these are my ride or die. Cindy and Brandon are my ride or dies. You, when you pop on, you're my ride or die. <laughs> I had to let them know that my gang's real. And I oh, never man. been no vampire. Oh, see my what God. I, Wait, what, what happened? See what I did there, though? Yeah, I see my, that. My gang's real, but I never been no vampire gang grill. Oh, uh, <laughs> that, that's another wall bar for you, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was, I was going through, like, I don't normally go through the comments on the Bullet Cast YouTube channel. I was going through them, and this was like, this was like from a month and a half ago. I was like, oh my God. Is? Yeah, I was like, what, what, what is this? Like, I, I deleted <laughs> the comment, you know, I was like, I don't want to see this ever again. Oh my God. Well, no, like, like, as you said, it was great. You and I on Saturday got to meet up in person, hang out for the first time in over a year. I mean, I think the last time you and I hung out in person was what? February, March, twenty twenty. It was um like we. It was the West Coast Pro Show. Actually, no, it was Stockton Con. Stockton Con. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I went to the SmackDown in February. I uh, shout out to the plug. But you also I, came. Uh, but you came in studio, right? The Bone Studio. Oh, that's right. In June. Okay. Oh, that yeah, that's oh my god. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So that's, okay. Oh my god! The anniversary of that's coming up. I know. I was going to say it's been almost uh, a year of the new era of in the click. On the twenty seventh, man. June twenty seventh. That's what it was. Yeah, the one year anniversary of of the new hope. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god! No, I was thinking about that. I was like, man, it's here we are in June, or like we're halfway uh, through the month, and I'm like. It's been about a year now since we re yeah rebranded well not even rebranded but like just relaunch this new era of in the click and so I was like yeah what's well, it June but I didn't know the exact date I was like oh my god I was trying to think about that earlier this morning yeah man this Saturday you and I got to hang out in person for the first time in a long time and uh, yeah you and I we met up we hugged it out and then we went over to Pacheco which for anyone listening Pacheco is right next to Concord in the East Bay here in the Bay Area and so yeah we went to Pacheco Square Garden which is the home of East Bay Pro Wrestling and a couple other promotions out there um, Phil do you happen to know the other ones off uh, top of WWZ, yeah, uh, Action Coast. That's right. And then uh, YWA is running their show Full Queer there the day after uh, Agua. 
So okay. Sunday, this coming Sunday. Yeah, okay, so June twentieth. So yeah, yeah, follow all all those promotions on social media. I know East Bay Pro Wrestling, not only are they an independent promotion here in the Bay Area, but they also are a wrestling school and they've had a lot of amazing talented people come through there. I think um Thunder Rosa has done some stuff there. I mean, her poster was up in, at, inside the facility. Yeah, her. I mean, uh, obviously, the world's freshest tag team. That's where they trained. Mm-hmm. Um, Juicy Finau, who, who's becoming a really big topic. Yeah. Uh, Rogue's done some training there. He's their champion. Mm-hmm. Um, the new sensation Jordan Blue is trained there. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, a, a, a lot of great talent is coming through that spot, man. Yeah, no, East Bay Pro Wrestling, uh, like the school itself, a lot of the upcoming, uh, I guess, this new generation of indie talent. I mean, that's something I think you and I have talked about recently was like, what, 2017, 2018, there was a really big independent independent scene boom going on. A lot of talented people from the Bay Area, yeah, um, and a lot of them have moved on to other things. And so now this new crop of talent is coming through. Yeah, man, like 20, 2016 to like... Really, 2019. I mean, 2020. Obviously, the pandemic hits, but like that—that that three years period. I mean, yeah. every, anybody who's anybody basically now in a in, in a major promotion came, like they either like trained out here or they dipped their toe in here. I mean, we say it all the time. You look at Hobbs, Fatu, Carl mm-hmm. Fredericks, Cobb, Zicky Dice, Thunder Rosa. You know, like b- b- people have you know come Levi Shapiro, Levi Shapiro. Yeah. yeah, you know. Even guys that have been on top for 10 plus years or 15 years, like a John Cena, dipped his toe in the Bay Area wrestling mm-hmm. scene back in the day. Mm-hmm. So did Brian Daniels. And, you know, so there's something about the wrestling scene here. It's absolute magic. And that's the thing. I don't think people might have realized. I mean, I think you and I noticed this was 2019 when AEW launched and they were signing a lot of top talent. They were free agents, people from the independent scene, like a Jungle Boy who's wrestled out here many times with APW and Pro Wrestling Revolution. And you know, we see other guys, Kratos, who's doing stuff with NWA. And I mean, the list goes on and on. It, it, but what I'm getting at is, so 2019, we saw a lot of talent. Jake Atlas is another one, even though he's from SoCal. He was wrestling. Shotzi. Up, Shotzi wrestling regularly up here. So a lot of this talent got picked up and signed. And I noticed end of 2019, when the wrestling shows you and I were going to, we started seeing a lot more newer faces Gain an opportunity to start working matches at these bigger shows. It was like a fresh crop of talent. And, you know, just from my own observation, I kind of noticed a lot of them were coming from this East Bay Pro Wrestling School or from this whole NorCal Bay Area wrestling scene. Yeah, man. A lot of them coming from SoCal, too. I mean, the indie scene out here in the Bay is basically like a money in the bank briefcase. <laughs> like, you know, really think about it. I mean, look at yeah. where people are. You mm-hmm. wrestle out here, you dip your toes in these waters, and you have a significant run. You're a quasi destined for success. Yeah, so that so that's the thing was like 2019. You start that's why I saw the world's freshest tag team kind of wrestle on a regular basis between APW and West Coast Pro Wrestling. So I started seeing them going, and I was like, oh my god, 2020! I cannot wait to see all these talented people kind of wrestle on a regular basis. Unfortunately, the whole world went upside down, the pandemic. So everything's been on hold. So now 2021, I'm starting to see them start getting matches booked once things starting to open up. So that's why I'm so excited to go out and support them and watch them. And I want to give a shout out to those guys, man, the world's freshest tag team. I mean, so the stuff he's been doing at GCW, he's been killing it. And, uh, Dre, I've actually known him since like 2017 before he was like wrestling really regularly. Okay. I, I met him at the California School of the Lucha Libre when that was in Hayward. Nice. Ran by Jason Styles and no training yeah. trained Bailey for a yeah, brief yeah. period of time. And just seeing him kind of put stuff together and meeting them at the Cow Palace show. And he says, man, I'm trying to get here. And he's on his way. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm incredibly proud of those two dudes, man. They'll be at Ugwa this weekend. I'll be there. Baby Huey's finally coming. <laughs> I was gonna like shit. It's gonna be a surprise. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You can tell everyone, but no, yeah. I was gonna like. It's gonna be. I was trying to like. How can I make this a big deal? Like I'm just, here. Just show up like Walter, dude. But yeah, man. I mean, I'm gonna shout do a run to, in. <laughs> shout out to those two boys. Like I'm extremely yeah. proud of those dudes, man. Yeah, absolutely. Just and that's the thing. Like I said, like 2019, the end. Like I said, it was a lot of fresh faces that I was starting to see regular and get booked here in the Bay Area. And I was like, oh man, 2020. This is gonna be the next crop of talent to really start 
paying their dues, getting noticed, working the loop all over California and other promotions, hopefully across the country. Obviously, the pandemic stopped everything. So I was really bummed for all of them. Kind of that, that momentum they were building just stopped. So that's why I'm super happy. Here we are mid 2021. Things are starting to open up. California is going to open up this week. And so I'm super excited and I really want to make an effort to go to many, as many of these shows as I can support them, you and I, and, and, um, I'm just really happy. And I, 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 I know it's going to be a little tough to kind of kickstart everything, get your momentum going again, but I'm really excited to see what all these guys can do and go out there and perform. But yeah, for the show itself, East Bay Pro Wrestling, I, I've been there a couple times over the years. It's been a minute since I've been back there. I noticed, uh, well, uh, shout out, kudos, thank you to Tim, the owner of, uh, East Bay Pro Wrestling. Um, just for the hospitalities for you and I, you know, he greeted us at the door, brought us in. And then, uh, um, um, just uh, he told me because I was looking around, I was like, it all looks different in here a little bit. And he told me they were at the old location, and there was a different location down the street. And I was like, oh, okay, because it was a warehouse. But I was like, looking, I was like, a little bit different, like the angles and stuff. And he said, oh, the last one I went to was at the old location. I'm like, oh, okay, but it's cool. You walk in, they got the you know person, a cashier, they got like a little, little merch stand, a uh, snack bar, uh, snack bar, um, the logo and everything. I was like, this is a really cool setup there have in there yo i want to put this out there cocky johnson watch out for him <laughs> that the mr east bay pro that dude is going to be a star okay so let me ask you this because i like the whole entrance the you know the setup and everything now it's in a warehouse is this similar i never been to the apw garage is it kind of a similar feel you never went to the garage. i never did i never been it's, there it's bigger there's more space because like you like if, if I mean you've seen Beyond the Mat and you, yeah. you've seen some old 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 footage, so the entrance was like it. I I don't want to say similar. Like there wasn't much room because there would be people around like all sides of the ring and they would have the bleachers and a lot of the times because they would just dive. Yeah, like, they didn't care. Like you just had to get out the way. You know what I mean? And there was like a, kind of like an upstairs, kind of like what you saw on a mm-hmm. Saturday. So. It, it is, but like it's it's slightly bigger than the garage. Mm-hmm. Okay, so slightly bigger than the garage. Okay, that's awesome because I was really like excited just the whole layout. I mean, I don't know about you, Phil, but like that was my first time seeing a pro wrestling show in. I, I think I, I said February 2020 when I went to SmackDown at the SAP Center. So what, 16 months seeing a live show? I'm just like. Oh my God. Like I miss the energy, the crowd, just, um, you know, people reacting off each other. Of course, you and I were smart. We wore our mask and everything. It just, uh, it felt normal, man. So to be back in that atmosphere with people cheering and reacting, booing to the uh, faces and heels, and it just felt so good. It just felt like, as you said, like normal, just being around that same atmosphere again, seeing the wrestlers. It was just, oh, it felt so good again. And um, masks are required to go in there. So we're all wearing our masks, being safe. But at the same time, it was just cool to be in that whole atmosphere again. Like, I, I can't praise it enough how great it was. And, uh, you know, they had six matches. Um, I really enjoyed seeing, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously for me, Midas Creed and Starboy Charlie was probably a banger of the, uh, of the night. They're the future of the business. They're the future of this business. And when I interviewed D rogue, he said it best, man. Like he's not just, like he and like this current group of talent, they're not just Bay Area or NorCal good. They're good in general. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm uh, like they, they they were awesome. Kimmy Diamond, who I'm a fan of, versus Jordan Blue, that was yeah. good. For the uh, Pacheco Square Garden Women's Title. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I mean, just the main event. We saw D Rogue and Cliff Hendricks take on Serza. Uh, I mean, yeah, pronounce that right, Serza. Serza, yeah, the uh, WWZ champion, the face of the revolution. And he was going to have his, his tag team partner, Sanders, didn't show up. He had a mystery uh, tag team partner and build up anticipation. Sure enough, it was uh, uh, Juicy. Uh, juicy Finale, Finale, the, Finale. New, the new era, Savage. Man, so he comes out, the crowd pops, and they all four of them start fighting outside the ring, getting chaotic, crazy. That was awesome. I loved all that stuff, and just a great match. And then uh, afterwards, uh, it, it ultimately ended up in a what, no contest, right, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, Serza got suplexed on those steps. I know. I saw that. I was like, oh, my God. But then uh, D-Rogue Cliff Hendricks had a stare down, and Cliff Hendricks 
tease potentially hitting D Rogue with the East Bay Pro Wrestling Championship title. Uh, and he's like, Funny. no, don't do the, let's, let's have a match. So their match is going to be in two weeks on the 26th. So, uh, I think you and I are going to try to get out there again for that one. Yes. Almost went home with the East Bay Pro title. <laughs> <laughs> D Rogue handed it to you. I was like, oh my God. Um, oh, the, the ring announcer got kicked in the face. Like, it was that's just chaos. right. Oh my no God. One? Yeah, dude. Uh, but yeah, Cocky Johnson, uh, really good just look and just uh, character. I the love cross that. Cross body onto the floor. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, oh my God, they just posted uh, on the East Bay Pro Wrestling tag, I'm just going to Instagram page, the results. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. No, Jordan Blue, I think it was her third match. Great work in there. Uh, taking on Kimmy. Um, definitely, she has a big uh, entourage and fan base out there. So that was kind of cool seeing that. Uh, but no, I, like I said, overall, a lot of fun. Um, shout out to Rick Luxury. He is uh, one of the coaches there, the trainers there. So if, if you want to uh, try out for uh, to be a professional wrestler, they, I definitely recommend checking out their school. They have an open tryout on Sunday, June 27, 12 to 5 p.m. Um, and check out their social media handles for all the info uh, on Instagram at EBP Wrestling. Uh, but yeah, check out East Bay Pro Wrestling on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for all the details. So uh, uh, it's going to be really cool. We're doing tryout. it, Huey. Chocolate and vanilla making their oh way to the room. Oh, my God, dude. Salt and I pepper. Don't... I don't hey, know if I can DDP do that. got in at 35, man. There's still hope. Dude, I'm 37 now. I don't, I cannot take a bump now. You're, I, you're I actually, I always wanted to take a bump, but I don't know if I can handle it. When I went to that trout at APW, man, it's it's, it's a whole other ball game. Like that, I, I respect those men and women. I do. Oh my god! But, but, I mean, the last show you you went to before that was SmackDown. Uh-huh. Speaking of SmackDown, what happened? Yeah, man. So let's talk about it. So right now for tonight or for this episode of In The Click, we're going to talk everything about Friday Night Smackdown and AEW Dynamite, both shows that happened this past Friday. A lot of stuff to get into, but let's talk about Smackdown first. And of course, the A story in all of WWE, Roman Reigns and his uh, cousins, the Usos, dominate Smackdown once again. Um I know you and I have not talked about it too much, but what do you think about the whole dynamic as of late? Roman Reigns, we've seen him and uh, Jay really working together, being you know a, a dynamic duo. You know Roman being Universal Champion, uh, Jay's helping him when he can. Jimmy's been back in the fold now for what a few weeks now, almost a month, and he's you know getting involved and kind of creating some drama. But what do you think of like the whole dynamic of all three of them? Oh, well, it adds something new to the Roman character and storyline. I mean, he, Jimmy, or no, Jay, Jay, Jay. Jay's torn in the middle between his brother and his cousin, you know. Because, I mean, if you go back to when Jay was feuding with Roman, if Jay didn't acknowledge him, he was going to be kicked out of the family. The same could be coming for Jimmy, you know. And 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 on SmackDown, you know, Jimmy said, you want to go? Oops, let's fight. And Roman's like, I don't want to fight you. I love you. Yeah. I'm doing this for us. I'm like. It, it, it has a level of realism. Anybody that's ever been able to um, or has had to take care of a family. And, you know, mm-hmm. th- this is where that Yoko Zuno doc really plays into effect here. You mm-hmm. see how he legit had to take care of the family because he was making that large amount of money. Roman's yeah. in the same position. It's just being shown on television. Yeah, it's a really interesting concept, what they've been introducing with Roman Reigns as far as as far as his whole heel work and his whole persona as the head of the table, the chief, the tribal chief, as far as what we've seen since his return, what last August SummerSlam, his whole MO is, listen, I have the weight of this entire family on my shoulders. I need to be universal champion because then I'm the number one person in this company. I'm making the most money. Therefore I can support this large family that everyone knows about. And so that's what his motivation is to kind of go down this darker path and have these more heel antics because at any cost necessary to retain and keep that title, to keep him at the number one person in this company, that's where the pressure comes from, which is understandable. Of course, he is very manipulative, uh, manipulating, you know, his cousins to, to, to work with him. And, uh, and that whole dynamic is a whole nother amazing layer, but just his motivation alone has been such great character work. And you look at Kevin Owens, what he, that's what he was doing in NXT, even going back to 
when he was Kevin Steen in Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. He's doing these dastardly things for his wife and his children. You can't yeah. hate a man that's fighting for his family. Yeah. So, um, you know, for anyone who's been watching SmackDown regularly, you know how this has been unfolding with Jimmy back in the fold. And so, uh, you know, this week, SmackDown open up. We see Roman and Jay sitting backstage in their suite, a Roman suite. And he's talking, you know, about last week, what happened when Roman destroyed the Mysterios. And all of a sudden, you hear Jimmy, the, the Usos music hit, and he looks up and he sees that Jimmy is going out to the ring and he calls out Roman. He says, dude, you got involved. We were about to be tag team champions, but you uh, we were going to be seven time champions. But no, it was all about you. You had to interfere and you prevent us from winning. That's not cool, man. All this stuff. It was really cool. I enjoy him calling him out on that. And then Roman ultimately tells Jimmy or excuse me, tells Jay that your brother go get him, bring him into the office. You know, I want to talk about this. And so Jay reluctantly is like, all right. And I like Jay's character work, how you can see in his face. He is like so dramatized from this because he wants to support his brother, but then he knows he needs to be there for Roman if he wants to stay in the family and, you know, get the support of Roman Reigns. So he is torn in the middle. I love all aspects of this. And then, um, um, so, you know, Jay leaves and he goes confronts his brother, you know, and he tells him, like, hey, you know, why are you doing this? And, and, you know, Jimmy is like, man, he doesn't want to help us, man. It's all about him. And, you know, constantly back and forth. And Jay's like, man, you've been gone this whole year. And I've had to like, uh, it's all about you. Like, I, I've had to like rise up and I, I'm at a new level now. It's like I've been by myself. And now you're trying to come back and take it away. It's just the whole dynamic back and forth has been amazing, all that stuff. Uh, but I guess I want to ask you. So and this has been like you know, throughout the night, they would check in on them. And at one point, you know, um, uh, Jimmy tells Jay, tell Rome to come see us in our locker room. And then Jay goes, tells him, he's like, all right, I'll go see him on my time. And then Roman finally gets up and goes, and there the three of them are in the Usos locker room, which was very nice decor in there. I don't know if you saw; it was very nicely set up. Andre the I forgot Jay I, won that, <laughs> which I love that detail. It's like, yeah, it shows Jay has been successful on his own. Main event Jay, so it was cool. They had the Andre the Giant Battle Royal from WrestleMania, the trophy in there as a reminder. Like, hey, he's done some great singles work. Um, He's stuck in the middle and he finally gets him. He's like, I, I can't handle this. I don't know which side to take. You guys are both tearing, like tearing him apart. And he just leaves. And then Roman confronts Jimmy by himself. I wanted to ask you about this whole dialogue here because Roman, like I said, he, I think he tries to manipulate his cousins, not necessarily to turn on each other, but I think he's trying to get them both on the same page and ultimately work for him. Is that a safe uh, yeah, observation? Yeah, no. That's the goal. Like Roman's basically saying, like, hey, look, by you acting out, you're getting in the way of the goal. And what's the goal for me to provide for this family, for our family? I'm not just doing this for my for my children. I'm doing it for yours. I'm doing it for Jay's. You know, I'm doing this so, so that our family has something to be proud of so that 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years down the line, they can look at the legacy that we've left, like High Chief and the Wild Samoans and Yoko have have done for us yeah well, notice, seems- I notice i didn't say rock <laughs> exactly well we'll see what happens uh the rumors are survivor series that it's the rock- 25th anniversary so it makes sense it makes sense so maybe we'll see the rock uh, later on this year but i like how this dialogue as far as um Jimmy is like, dude, Roman, this is how it's always been since we've been growing up. It's always been about you. It's always been about you it's not about us and Roman's like yes it has always been about us that's all I know how to do is be the best. So Roman, from his perspective, like his whole life, he's been like breed to be the best in order to provide for the family. It's like, that's all he knows. Yeah, man. I mean, I used to, I, I, I can kind of attest to this because I, I used to go to the, uh, the high school they went to when I was living in Florida. I used to go to that high school, the Scambia. And I would hear stories about a Joe on a Y. I'm like, what the hell is that? And then all the and pop up a couple years later. I'm like, Oh, Mm-hmm. Oh, that Roman dude is him. Okay, no, I legit like this is a shoot. I legit heard stories about him like just having a hard a work ethic, wanting to be the best, and you know he made it to Georgia Tech and all mm-hmm. and all that stuff like that. So this is that, that's that's real. And the heel like the best thing about heels they have realism to them. 
Mm -hmm. This is something real. Well, the thing that I enjoyed about this was Roman, what he was saying, he was almost like spinning it back on Jimmy and be like, dude, it's always been about us. That's how I view this. It's all about us working together. And like I said, I grew up, all I knew how to be was the best. So I think he's trying to justify his stance. And in a way, I think he's trying to spin it back on Jimmy and saying like, you're being selfish. You're trying to turn your brother against me. That's not right. It should be all about us. But I think it, but at the same time makes you question since Roman is a heel. What is his true motivation? Was he really trying to get out of this? Ultimately, I think he wants his, the Usos to work for him and ultimately be his, his lackeys, his guard dogs. I don't know what we want to call it. Like what's the right term, but to protect him and make sure yeah. he retains that universal championship for year for a long time. Yeah, man. I mean, I look a couple weeks ago. I laid out the three year plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want Roman to start going to the other members of the family. Like, 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 let's say, you know, like, let's say, uh, he goes to Tamina and be like, "What are you doing? Yeah. Are, are you you've been here for how long? And this, and you finally got this? Are you really happy with this? Yeah. What do you really want?" And then let's say Tamina turns on Natalia, costs her the title, and then what if a uh, uh, just a badass monster Tamina took the title off of Bianca? Or maybe you know, get Naomi involved. You know, Naomi is well, she's uh, on Raw. I mean, there's yeah. a dr- there's a draft coming up after after SummerSlam. Yeah, but you know, that's Jimmy's wife, and be like, hey, listen, why are you working with Natty? You know, you should be working with your sister in law or you know, cousin in law, wherever well, the well, the, Roman the, could counter, but she's not blood. Mm, okay, that could be interesting as well, and it makes it tough on Jimmy. It's like you, who you can pick your wife for the bloodline here. I mean, oh god, the dynamics of all this really could evolve. Um, you know, at first, I will admit, like I was a little worried. Like, are they just going to copy and paste what we saw Roman and Jay have at the end of last summer and early fall? That whole dynamic, and at least it's a little bit different this time around. You know what I just thought about, and where where this could really this is going to lead to a match where. It's Jimmy versus Roman for the title. And you remember the, the WrestleMania 28, Taker versus Hunter with Sean as a special guest referee? Mm-hmm. I think we can see that level of storytelling and emotion come out of Jey Uso. Where he's t- he's torn, you know, he's torn between... Because Sean, he was torn between his best friend and his probably his greatest rival. And, mm-hmm. and, and Jay, he'll be torn between his brother and then his cousin. You know, I, th- I think we can see that level of storytelling come out of these guys. I wonder when they would do that because, OK, let's look on the timeline here. We got Hell in the Cell this weekend, which we already know what Roman's match is going to be. We'll get into that in a second. What's the next pay- Money in the Bank's the next pay-per-view. Money in the Bank. And then there's SummerSlam. And the rumor with SummerSlam is they want Cena versus Roman. So, I mean, if they want to do it this summer... It would be money in the bank, but that would be kind of with that. I, I guess timing wise, we, it could work. I, I, we do it weeks. after some. We do it after SummerSlam. Yeah, you do it after have, SummerSlam. Have Jimmy nearly cost Roman the title? Like he, like he, like like have him against like, Cena. Yeah, and then and then the next SmackDown. What the hell are you doing? You know, almost, I almost lost it on the biggest stage this year or whatever at SummerSlam, and then he's like, I don't, but, I don't, think, I don't think I can trust you. Let's have a but, match. Yeah, I'd be like, but lucky for you, I did what I always do. I show up and win. Yeah, man. Because I'm just thinking. So, what, like I said, like it, it's not complete copy and paste of last year with Roman and Jay. This obviously having Jimmy involved. It's a whole new layer. And then what's really been standing out is just Jay. Jay, like I said, looks so torn. Even when he's talking to his brother, do you notice they're twins, but Jay has like gray in his beard and Jimmy doesn't. That's the stress. Exactly. That's another element. If you look at that little detail, the character work of like, even though Jay is in Roman's good graces for right now, the cost emotionally is taken on him. That toll of trying to please his cousin, yeah, please his cousin, but then now stressing, trying to worry about his brother. I mean, that little detail, I mean, whether it's natural or it, 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 they purposely did it like that, um, it, for me, it just really, the symbolism there is really powerful and just shows how much this is taking a toll on poor Jay and all this. But uh, The story is so good. I, I know, it. yeah, it, it's so engaging. And that's the thing, it's amazing to me. It's like they have this great storyline and then there's all these other storylines in WWE that are just falling very flat. <laughs> so, um, like I said, it, it, it was just great. Like I said, Roman confronting Jimmy and telling him, like, listen, like, he's borderline being, he's saying you're being selfish. You're trying to pull your brother away from me when I'm trying to make it all about us. And so 
he's really spinning it onto Jimmy and like, you're the bad guy in this situation. So, and, but Jimmy's like, well, no, you're, you're pulling your, my brother against away from me. And, and like I said, I love earlier in the night where Jimmy told Jay, like, you're my brother's keeper, man. I'm your twin brother. I'm your, like, it's supposed to be you and I together, no matter what. So it's just the whole family dynamic has just been so interesting. Um, where it goes from here, be interesting. Like, do the Usos win the tag titles and then fully embrace working for Roman and therefore all three of them have gold of their own? Well, I think I think you, you, you need to do Roman versus Jimmy before they get before they actually win the titles. It's like he's gotta beat him up to bring him over. Like how he, like, beat, he beat up Jay. Yeah, like we'll we'll take some elements of that, but it, it's different, you know, because because of the dichotomy of yeah. Jay being involved and and being torn. Yeah, so it's almost this guy beat the crap out of him in order to be like, see, you can't beat me. You might as well join me. And then, you know, you, you remember when Miro beat up Kip Sabian and he consoled him? Roman yeah. needs to do the same thing. He needs to beat the living shit out of Jimmy Uso yeah. and then be like, I'm sorry I had to do this to you. Or kind of like a Sean, like, I'm sorry I love you. Boom. Yeah. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, no, all that, it, it, it's going to be really engaging and like, you know, I want them to take their time, but at the same time, I'm kind of at the point. It's like, where's this going to go? Like, kind of tease me or let me know where it's heading to. I like the idea of what you have is like maybe Jay becomes a referee between Jimmy and Roman, and then ultimately Roman, you know, beats the crap out of Jimmy, and Jimmy finally sides with it, acknowledges Ooh. him. And 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 Jay tries to super kick Jimmy, but he accidentally hits Roman. Yeah, that too. There's so many layers that to go with this, but uh, so. Later on in the night, we see Rey Mysterio cutting an interview. And in regards to the events that last week, Roman beat the crap out of both the Mysterios. Rey's very upset because he, he's a father and he's upset that he let his son down, Dominic. He's supposed to protect him, but he wasn't there to protect him from Roman Reigns getting handing their asses to them. Um, he says he's going to go out to the ring and call him out. So Rey goes to the ring and just says, Roman, get out here. And Roman comes to the ring and, he, you know, he pretty much challenges him to a Hell in a Cell match, which I think it's a little fast. It's like, oh, yeah, because Hell in a Cell is next weekend. It's like, oh, we're just going to jump right into that. But it makes sense a little bit from family versus family. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, I, I honestly, like Cesaro and Rollins, they deserve the Hell in the Cell more than these guys do. <laughs> yeah, because the, 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 their rivalry has been going on much longer and there's been multiple matches. So. I'm with you. I think Hell in the Cell, which, I mean, this is a bigger issue. I, I, I do not like WWE having a whole pay-per-view dedicated to Hell in the Cell. Like, I hate I mean, the, when they... The, 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 look, the only gimmick pay-per-views we actually need are Elimination Chamber and Money in the Bank. Exactly. And the well, obviously the Rumble, you know, but other than that, like, like, like no. I, I'm with you. It's like Hell in the Cell should be used for... As like the the final battle between two people that have like such bad blood between them, the only way to settle the score is in a Hell in a Cell match. Like what's and, going on with Lashley and McIntyre. Exactly, and it just have it at a pay per view as like maybe the main event or something, but don't have a whole pay per view name after that stipulation because then you're just horseshoeing or uh, you're forcing yourself to. Uh, create matches for that that might be a little premature to that point. No, I mean, there have been held in some matches in the past that didn't deserve it, but they've delivered. True. Absolutely. That is true. But I just feel like, okay, they're like, crap, look at the calendar. All right, this June, we got Hell in the Cell. It's like, okay, what storylines can we create real Which, quick? Which, why is it in June now? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I guess for them, they were like, because I know it was, what, it's October, but they're like, okay, this is the last pay-per-view before going back on the road. Since it's Hell in the Cell, for they people... do some cool stuff. Yeah, and also think about it, you know, for... It is the last show, a pay-per-view in the Thunderdome. They're like, okay, this is a match that's better served for people watching at home because they have all the cameramen inside. For people in attendance, it's a little bit hard to see because <laughs> of the big red cell. Well, so they're probably figuring, I, all right, we'll sacrifice this early and just focus on presentation inside for the fans at home. I mean, like I've seen like a regular Hell in the Cell live, Ambrose and Rollins. I've, I haven't seen like a, the Red Cell yet. I did. I saw that one in Sacramento, the Fiend and Seth Rollins. We, that never happened. Oh my god, dude! It, but it was tough because the red lights, the Red Cell. I could barely see what was going on. It was terrible. Well, besides the red light, I mean, wasn't there another Hell in the Cell match on that on that show? Oh, um, um, 
Sasha and, and Becky, um, right? Yeah, that's right. So how was that? Could you see that? That was a little bit better. It was because the full lights were on, but yeah, it was still a little tough. Uh, just because the red, like the way the red was glaring on my eyes and stuff. Yeah, but so, uh, what, what was it? Oh yeah, so the, what? What? Uh, you know, the, the Ray goes out there and he he says, "Roman, I acknowledge you for being this, this, and that." And Roman's looking at him like, "You stupid little man." <laughs> And then Roman's like, well, I'll acknowledge you. And then you see, like, the kindo stick slide into the ring. And- yeah, who slid in that candle? So the, the kindo- was, <laughs> Domin- that Domi- was that supposed to be Dominic? Yeah, they were supposed to allude that it was Dominic. And okay. then um, Ray starts hitting Roman, and Roman kind of takes care of Ray. Then Dominic gets in there, and Roman yeets Dominic. <laughs> and, but here's my problem with it. Yeah. You can clearly threw him pretty far. And then, like, when Ray gets thrown outside the ring, he's, like, really closer to the ring. Yeah. Well, I mean, and listen, so, you know, Dominic comes running in, hits him with the candlestick as well, and then Roman beats him up, and then, yeah, picks him up and throws him out of the ring, but the shot, the way it's shot, it's from the ground up, and you're watching Roman th- launch Dominic, but you never see Dominic actually land, and then they cut back to the ring, and Ray, or Roman turns around and it's like looking at Ray, and then they cut back around, and you see just Dominic laid out on the floor, you would assume, okay, sorry to break kayfabe, he probably landed on a crash pad or something. And then once once Roman turned around and focused attention elsewhere, they quickly took the crash pad out, and Dominic just laid there, act like he fell from far up high. Darby Allen would have really took that bump. I know, exactly. So and then my, my thing is, like, okay, you see Dominic laid out there, and uh, I will admit, that's kind of one advantage wwe has had over the last year of working in the thunderdome since there's no live audience there they're able to kind of do a little more trickery with the camera work and like create certain angles and cut shots because they don't have to they're not going to spoil anything about it because there's no fans looking and, and you can burn men alive exactly <laughs> or, you know stuff with alexa bliss like you can kind of have more fun with the camera work since you don't have a live audience to worry about pleasing it's all about just the people at home watching tv so you can do stuff behind the camera and no one will ever see it but uh but visually that looked great just seeing roman launch dominic and just how a badass he was you know the, the hair is all over the place he's like it's like a, a lion coming alive, you know what I mean? Like he's like a ferocious lion just tearing it up. It was great. Uh, so I just I love seeing that part of it all. And then uh, uh, so yeah, the lights cut out. So yeah, Roman agrees to the Hell in a Cell match with Rey Mysterio. So like I said, very quick build because next week is the Go Home episode of SmackDown before Hell in a Cell. But I'll buy it. You know, hey Rey Mysterio, you know one of the best, if not the best, luchador of all time. Take it on Roman Reigns. Um, even though it's a quick bill, there is, you know, a lot of anger there between the two of them, especially Ray wants to defend his son's honor and be a protective father. So uh, I'm looking forward to this match. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so, yeah, I can't wait. And then uh, um, uh, also and we know Roman when he's in Hell in a Cell, he's very ferocious. We saw what he did with his cousin last year. So he's never lost inside the cell. It should be. a Oh, yeah. Because he also faced uh, Braun. Right? That was a no contest. He's beaten Rusev. He's beaten his cousin. No contest with Braun. He's never lost in there. Oh, my God. Okay. This is going to be a lot of fun. See He's what Mr. That, Hell in the Cell. I was going to say how the Usos can get involved and all that stuff. Uh, quickly just run down. So we saw Kevin Owens, Big E, defeat Sami Zayn, Apollo Crews. Apollo Crews is like, you know, Sami Zayn's a loser. I want a rematch. And he's going to have Commander Z be his tag partner. So ultimately, this match was just a setup. Uh, Commander Aziz debut for next week in the ring. So we'll see how that goes and his in ring work. Um, probably match of the night was Montez Ford taking on Chad Gable one on one match. Dude, Philip, this was a, a banger. Chad Gable is so good in the ring. Yeah, man. This is this is this is what Shorty G was doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> from, from a pure just wrestling standpoint, this dude is so good, man. He's so crisp. I mean, he's a 2012 Olympian, he's mm-hmm. an amateur standout, you know. Um, I, I wish I could say I was an amateur standout back in the day, but now, <laughs> you know, well, but, but I mean, just, it was so good. I mean, like, and like Montez would get some offense and he would go for the Tyrus moves. I mean, when he went for the springboard and he caught him in a Northern lights, I was like, Oh my God, yeah, dude, I've, ne- I've never seen that spot before. That was so killer. I mean, just what Chad Cable Gable can do creatively in the ring and like counter these, Move like he does such an amazing job with his suplexes, and so how he can catch people and throw them. It, 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 it's he's so talented. Um, granted, he's in a tag team right now with Otis. 
I do wish he does get a, a good proper singles run at some point, but at least he's on TV on a regular basis right now, which I'll take. I'll I take think, that. I think he and Otis will win those tag titles sometime down the line. I think eventually, yeah, they are destined for that. So, uh, but yeah, before this match started, you know, Chad Gable confronted Street Profits and said, "Hey, I got the match called off." But then he was talking crap to them, and Montez Ford says, "I'll, I'll challenge you to that match." Uh, we see um, uh, Angelo Dawkins. Uh, uh, Wait, this, is it right? Ang- oh, yeah, Angelo. Wait. Angelo Dawkins, yeah. Yeah, Angelo Dawkins, right. Um, you, was, you notice how he was looking at the TV screen kind of weird, like at the weird angle, like cheering on uh, Montez for. I, I was kind of laughing at that. I was like, dude, the way he's kind of looking at the camera was kind of funny. But ultimately, we see Otis come from behind, attack him, takes him out, and then he comes out to the ring. The finish was a little botched. Did you notice that? So Yeah, Mo- Otis didn't get there in time. Exactly. Montez Ford hit the frog splash. And Chad Gable, you know, that would be the finish right there. That's his finisher. But Otis was late to break up the pin and cause the DQ. So instead, Chad Gable had to quickly uh, count out or, you know, uh, 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 what's the word? Oh, my God. Uh, kick out. Yeah, kick out. Yeah. But then Otis ran in at the same time. So they all kind of landed on each other. So it made for a little wonky finish. But nonetheless, it, the ref called it a DQ. And then, uh, yeah, Otis destroyed Montez Ford and then uh, Angelo Dawkins come out and they destroyed him as well. So, man, Otis looked very tall as like a monster here. But the big question, what do you think of his new look, the shaved beard? He Everyone looks was like laughing. something from a movie, bro. Like some... Pee-wee Herman. No. He looks like the villain from Pee-wee Herman's Big Adventure. The little boy? The, no, the guy who wanted Pee Wee's bike. Um, no, was it Francis. No, um, no it, was like, it was like he looks like a, a like a bully from a movie, like Matilda uh, or something. I feel like I want to say the show was um, the movie was Matilda. I could okay. be wrong. Oh, okay. No, but look look at this guy, the actor from. Oh P- God! So if you look at Francis Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the guy who wanted Pee Wee's bike the, from the eighties. That's what you look like. Everyone was comparing him to you. So if that's, you look, I might have to do a comparison fun. on social media. So check it out. Francis Buxton. That was his name. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, but like Otis, man, like, it, you know, he's really been evolving into this monster heel with the Alpha Academy. I will admit it's a little tough for me because I'm like, oh, if you're having him be this monster heel, like, I really wish Heavy Machinery was still around because they could have been a badass monster tag team. I mean, granted, like I said, I, Chad Ooh. Gable, Heavy Machinery. <laughs> Remember Who was that? that? I know it's been a minute now. But anyway, like I said, uh, um, uh, uh, Otis looked great here. And so, I mean, obviously, uh, they, uh, kayfabe Montez Ford was injured. They said breaking news on social media. He's out injured. So, um, I don't know if Angelo's going to go at this by himself and try to take on Otis by himself next week. That's what I'm guessing what's going to happen. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, last thing we'll talk about real quick was uh, the whole ding dong hello segment with Bailey. Uh, she had Seth Rollins come out uh, and they both were just kind of admiring each other and praising each other for their work. Was there anything else that stood out for you in this whole segment? Those laughs, bro. They're they're doing their best million dollar man. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. Um, no, it, it was fine. I mean, they both, you know, as heels acknowledging each other, both respect each other. Uh, but ultimately, Cesaro comes sneaking in and beats up Seth Rollins, rips his pants off, so he runs off in his underwear. And then uh, Bianca Belair comes out and is laughing at her as well. So just setting up their match for uh, Hell in a Cell. Kind of lackluster towards the yes. end. Otis looked like Majin Buu from uh, from uh, Dragon Ball Z. Oh my god, <laughs> that's what it was. Okay, that's what it was. I'll send, okay. I'll send you this right now. Oh my gotcha. god. Gotcha. So anyway, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it did its purpose of like setting it up. Uh, uh, you know, the heels and the baby faces. Um, you know, I will admit, kind of laughter is a little starting to get a little annoying. Like they're both laughing back and forth, and that daily- was the point. I know. I mean, guys, heels. I get it. Um, I will admit, one segment I'm getting tired of is whole Shinsuke Nakamura and King Corbin stuff. It's turned into like a battle of five series now for the crown. So we'll see who gets the crown, I guess, on next week's episode of SmackDown. But overall, you know, hey, good solid show from SmackDown. Obviously, the Usos and Roman Reigns is like the main story that's carrying everyone. Um, all right, let's move on over to the other show that happened this past Friday was AEW Dynamite. Um, you know, Last week's episode of Dynamite, I was like not totally impressed. I think this one was a lot better. I don't know about you. It seemed like they really tried to squeeze a lot of segments in here. If you look at like, the whole recap on their website, 
a lot happened in this two hour episode of Dynamite. You know what I mean? Yeah, we were talking with those guys after East Bay Pro, and we were like trying to think of the problems with Dynamite. This is one of them. They try to pack too much into it in, into one show. Exactly. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying because it's like I feel like sometimes Dynamite they try to squeeze too much in, and it's like I think sometimes it's better to let things breathe a little bit more, and you know let things like sizzle for a bit and that way you know these moments when they happen you know it has a bigger emotional impact but they think sometimes they they do one segment then they move on to the next segment then the next segment and they'll have time to breathe and really just like appreciate what happened you know what i mean and like let it sink in yeah yeah absolutely i mean it's just it like the, the, I mean, they 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 move things too quickly. They they take too long to do certain things. They try to pack things and into the whole show. Like it, it, we need to, we just need to find like the right formula. Like like when they first aired on TNT. Exactly. So yeah, it was fine. Yeah. So here's the thing that was interesting. So the opening match here was Christian Cage taking on um, and Helico, and he was hired by Matt Hardy to take out Christian Cage, which I was kind of laughing. Like, okay. And Helico, Jack Evans, it's cool to see him back on TV again. We haven't really seen them that much. But, you know, for Matt Hardy, okay, you're trying to take out Christian Cage. You hate him. You are you have money, so you're trying to pay people off to take him out. Out of everyone on the AEW roster, you hire and Helico that's, to do your dirty work? That's not even the problem. Like, the problem is, like, where where's Private Party? Where's Butcher? Where's Blade? Those guys are under Matt Hardy's payroll. They're part of the Hardy family office. Where are all those guys at? I know. I'm just... It's... Matt Hardy, like, his time in AEW so far has been really weird. Like, he came and, you know, he was, you know, had his whole, um, you know, oh, my God, the the delete. Um, Broken, woken thing. Yeah. And then he kind of went back to, like, more of a regular Matt Hardy. And then he was trying to have, like, all these different alter egos, like, three different versions of him. I don't know if he was trying to do his best impression of Mick Foley, the three faces of Matt Hardy. And then all of a sudden, just randomly, he's like, he turned into this heel rich guy. And I was like, it just kind of came out of nowhere. Like, these sudden changes, it just doesn't seem, like, organic. That's what gets kind of frustrating. It, yeah, it, it did come out of nowhere. And it's it's like I mean, did this thing happen on dark or be, being the elite? Because I mean, if if so, I mean, you have to really you have to really look at it like this. A lot of people don't watch dark. Yeah, a lot a lot of people don't watch dark elevation. I mean, if you keep up with being the elite, I mean, it's not it's not what it once was. It's not what it used to be. Mm-hmm. So uh, I mean, I don't know, man. Like you have to you have to like let people know like what's going on with these characters if you want to feature them. On primetime television. Yeah, I like I like I kinda wish they would do more backstage segments and like they do a pretty good job with the interviews, you know, either with Alex Marvez or whoever interviewing these people, getting them amped up for the match. But I kinda wish they would do more stuff outside the ring, like confrontations in the hallway or you know, wherever to kind of build up the feud to lead to the match. And I mean, they do some of that as we saw with the inner circle later on, we'll get into, um, but I feel like they don't do a really good job of sometimes really expanding the story. Like, I feel like a lot of times they just throw all these matches together, but don't have like a proper build or storyline outside the ring that gets me engaged and really care emotionally about what's going on in the ring. They just announce all these matches all the time. And I'm like, Oh, this is coming out of nowhere. Okay, I guess yeah, I'll take did, it. Did you notice they they added another faction? Which one? The Wingmen. It's oh what, yeah, exactly. Nemeth, uh, Avalon, JD Drake, and uh, Caesar Bononi. Like, I, what, what are we doing? I know, I know. Look, you have all this talent. You can't just throw them in factions. That's that's not how this works. Yeah, that's not how this works. If you don't know what to do with guys, you you pull you pull you pull a WWE. You cut them. I know you can't hire everyone. You can't keep everyone. Yeah. You talk about WWE hoarding talent. Look what these guys are doing. Yeah. Now, given these guys can work other places sometimes, sure, but still, no, you can't. You can't just have all this talent. Mm-hmm. And like, and that, that's another like dark and dark. I know I'm going off on a tangent, but like this needs to be said. I love AEW. I love them to death. Yeah. You know? They reinvigorated my love for this business. Dark and dark elevation is too long. Why are you having 16 matches each? You think WrestleMania is too long? Jesus Christ. Yeah. Huh? I, I'm with you. It's like dark and elevation should be an hour each. 
and if it's like five matches, five quick matches, whatever, or whatever. Bro, go, go, hell, hell, go back to the original Raw format. The main events at the start of the show, and then there's squash, squash matches for the rest. We can do that. Or you can do four squash matches and then a big main event. You can, you can do stuff like that. Yeah. I'm hoping maybe when they go back on the road, maybe things will change as far as the structure of the show presentation. That's what I'm kind of hopeful for. Maybe it's just they're stuck at Daly's place. They're kind of limited on what they can use around the facility. But I, I'm with you. It's like I feel like they need to do a better job setting up some of these stories. But like I said, here in this opening match here, and Helico all of a sudden hired by Matt Hardy. is like, wait, when did this happen? Did he approach him? Like, he, Matt just quickly cut the promo in the rings. Like, I hired him to take out Christian Cage. Like, you know, maybe... Maybe like on an episode of Dynamite, Matt Hardy's like pissed off walking down the hall and then Helico says, hey, man, I hear you have a problem. I would love to help you out. I, you know, I'm, I'm a higher gun. But no, it's just randomly. Oh, yeah. He's, Matt Hardy's hired this, paid this guy off to take out Christian Cage. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I mean, like I said, of all guys and Helico, I know he's a very talented in-ring worker, but like he hasn't been hardly on TV I don't think a lot of people know who he is, and I just don't think he's a really credible threat to take out Christian Cage. Like, if I'm Matt Hardy, maybe pursue Brian Cage, who has issues with, um, you know, with Team Taz or something. Try to lure him over. Well, that makes sense, and a lot of times wrestling doesn't make sense. If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. The match itself was really good. I mean, Christian yeah. Cage, you could tell he was leading it, calling the shots in this match, calling the spots. It was really good. But then what was funny was, you know, afterwards, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Christian Ch- wins. Yeah. And then, um, let me see. Oh, my God. Sorry, I lost my track. Go ahead. What were you going to say? What you thought about no, this? No, I mean, like, in Helico, I mean, if you know his background and his story, which that's actually the beauty of Excalibur. He knows a lot of these guys' backgrounds, which mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a great asset uh, on, uh, on, on, on commentary and dynamite and whatnot. Yeah. Like, you learn he's from South Africa. You know, he yeah. learned from Ultimo Dragon. He's entranced with the technical side of this business and, and the Lutra Libre and the Triple A and the CMLL and all that other stuff. But yeah. no, actually, okay, I remember what I was going to talk about. So this is something I saw even John LaRocca posts on Twitter, which, by the way, follow John LaRocca on Twitter. He has great analysis of all these episodes of Dynamite. So we saw, you know, Christian Cage wins with the kill switch, Pins and Helico. Tag partner Jack Evans comes running in. He tries to kick him but misses. And then uh Christian Cage takes out Evans. Then Matt Hardy comes in and try and then attacks Christian Cage with the twist of fate. Then we see Jungle Boy run out and make the save for Christian Cage. Because you know they have a little thing going right now ever since Double or Nothing. Now the funny part was, and this is like the little things in detail that I get frustrated with AEW. You got three heels, Matt Hardy and and Helico and Jack Evans. You see Jungle Boy coming running out to the ring. All three of them scram off. And it's like, okay, Christian, Christian Cage is knocked out. Jungle Boy comes running out. Doesn't have a chair or anything. He should have some sort of weapon to scare them off. He comes out with nothing. If he had a chair, at least that could be like his form of an equalizer to take out these three heels. You know what I mean? It's just, it's fr- like these are three heels. They, they should not be afraid of Jungle Boy coming out there by himself. They should totally be like, all right, bring it on and try attacking him. But instead they go running off. So it's just, it's just that little detail that gets a little frustrating. It's like, you know, pay attention to every aspect of it, like the storytelling of it all. So anyway, that's, you know, I I get frustrated with that, that stuff like that. It's like, okay, jungle boy's running out there, but he's by himself with no weapon, no chair. It's like, it's not going to happen. I mean, even remember like stone cold back in the day would come out with a chair or something, kick some ass. And I don't know all that stuff. Yeah. And like, I mean, like, I mean, this skinny scrawny kid coming out there, like what's he going to do? Hit you with his hair. Yeah, going to catch exactly. with the sideburns. Like, we're like, what yeah. are we doing? I mean, even Darby yeah. Allen will come out with like a thumbtack skateboard. You know, <laughs> exactly. Um, so another segment we want to touch on real quick is Cody Rhodes. He comes into the ring with uh, Aaron Anderson and Aaron's son Brock Anderson. <laughs> Which to me, I, I think a lot of people are like, can't get over how. Oh my God, AEW has a guy named Brock, but it's Aaron Anderson's son. <laughs> I think a lot of people are like, what? Brock Lesnar's coming. So, Look, if there, if there was one time to change a guy's name, like you could have called him Brody. I know. <laughs> and, and that's something you and I were talking about on Saturday when riding over the East Bay Pro Wrestling. Of like, of all names in pro wrestling to have. You have the name Brock. I mean, come on. There's only one Brock Lesnar. It, it, it's like there's only I, one Brock in general. 
Exactly. And so, like, of all the names to have, like, could they repackage him with a different name? Because, yeah, he's going to get all the comparisons to Brock Lesnar just because they have the same first name. He can't be Mr. Anderson because, well, you know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so, like, I, I don't know, like, I, Arn Jr. There was a Ted DiBiase Jr. There could be an Arn Jr. Maybe AJ. And you know what's going to make this compelling for him? Because, you know, QT comes out, interrupts him, yeah. and QT challenges Cody to a South Beach strap match. Which, out of nowhere, like, why Why that? Like, why that match out of nowhere? It's like... Because the, he wants to he wants to fight him in Miami, and that's South Beach. But it's like Cody's beaten all that all members of that team already. No, he, no, he hasn't. He hasn't beaten oh. Camarado and, and Solo. He hasn't beaten those two yet. He beat, uh, oh, okay, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, okay. But still, but he beat, like, their best guy, uh, Anthony Agogo, so it's like, and that's, QT Marshall. That, that, the, 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 he's only had three matches, and if he's their best guy, they're in trouble. I just, I'm like, <laughs> I just feel like this whole rivalry is kind of going nowhere. It's like, I don't care anymore. It's the longest thing Cody's done in a while. You know what's going to make this interesting? What's that? Is when um, Bro- Brock needs to turn, Brock needs to turn on Cody. Mm-hmm. And then he needs to cut a promo next week. Hopefully he can do that. And he needs to say, all my dad can talk about is you, you, you. And it makes me sick. <laughs> exactly. Well, the thing is, I, I like about Brock Anderson. I like his look. He obviously looks like a young Arn Anderson. But I will admit, it's kind of funny. Like He's wearing these shorts, and he's got his shirt tucked in. He looks like he just got off the golf course or something. That's how Arn used to dress on Nitro, dude. I guess, yeah. I was trying to think about that, make that comparison. But I don't know. It's just kind of funny. But I do love his mannerism, his body language. He has his hands on his uh, hips just like his dad and they look just alike so I, I did pop for that I thought that was really cool um, but yeah QT Marshall comes out challenges Cody for that the uh, was it South Beach strap match South Beach strap match so he takes his belt off and he hits Arn Anderson with the belt shouldn't he go after Cody first with the belt like I- he was sending a message Shout, uh, some sweet double leg by Brock yeah, exactly. He took him down, took QT Marshall down, started being the crap out of him. So I enjoyed that. I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, Cody and, and, and Brock are going to have a match next week against Solo. And um, uh, who's against, is against Solo and... Uh, it's Solo and QT, right? Next week? or, or be, Yeah, yeah. it's QT and Solo against Brock and uh, Cody. So I'm looking to see Brock's in-ring debut. Yeah, the QT and Solo need to win to gain cr- credibility and momentum. Yeah, Brock can be the one to eat the pin since it'll be his first national televised match. But I want to see Brock. Has he, is that going to be his first match ever? Like I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember hearing about this guy. But I want to see Brock hit a spine buster like his dad. If he hits a spine buster, yeah. I'll pop. You know what's crazy? Arn's finisher was the DDT, but yeah. that spine buster, it, it, it's that. That's his sig. It was, man. I loved it. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Uh, next up was the tagged, uh, let's see, uh, six man tag. Young Bucks, Brandon Cutler taking on Eddie Kingston and Death Triangle, which is Pac and Penta El Zero Miedo. Uh, Ray Phoenix is battling another injury, which is like, I, I don't know about you. I get so bummed out because, like, I feel like, uh, uh, Ray Phoenix is like stop and go for him when he has his matches. But um, this match was good. It was a lot of fun, a lot of high flying action. The Young Bucks are really starting to embrace the heel persona, being like the real cocky, like immature brats. I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, but I don't know about you, but Brandon Cutler, his whole gimmick now, like wearing the red jumpsuit, has like the face mask. He's filming with the camera all the time. I, I don't get it. Like, dude, we we know his story. We know he's a wrestler. Like they they had the whole storyline a couple years ago when he signed his contract with AEW it was like his first major contract with the promotion. We've seen him wrestle on dark many times. You know, it's like old dragon look. It's yeah, like, he, he I think he wrestled on the first episode of Dynamite against yeah, MJF. He, he is a legit wrestler. Now he's acting like in the ring with the red jumpsuit, like he acts like this incompetent guy who doesn't know how to wrestle now. Like I don't get this. Well, he's their young boy. But it's like, dude, we know you can well, wrestle. It's like all well, of a sudden now I, you're acting like you, you're, it's I mean, the first time did, in the ring. Well, well, I mean, he did like the springboard attempted whatnot. At the end, yeah. yeah. I mean, this match was fine, but the thing that was kind of annoying, and I saw even John LaRocca points this out on Twitter, was, you know, uh, we see Pac um, just sitting on the top corner, and we see Matt Jackson laid out. And Pac is just waiting because all the other guys in the ring got to do their spots first. Then finally... 
He hits the 450 splash. and then, But then, instead of just pinning him, he puts him in the submission hold. And Nick Jackson comes running in and he's trying to kick him, but he won't let go. Like, it shows how, how hard he has the submission in. But then, finally, Eddie Kingston comes in. Then he breaks it. Let's, let's go. It's like, dude, you had him beat with your 450 and the submission hold. Why are you going to let go for Eddie Kingston coming in? And then... Uh, Eddie Kingston almost cost him the match the roll up, but then Eddie Kingston made the save at the end. They both do the the dot because I know Pac is kind of hesitant to work with Eddie Kingston, but we saw them work together, do the dive, the the double suicide dive on the outside. Wait, bro, Eddie Kingston doing a suicide dive was great, and I think Pac <laughs> did a uh, he did a spaceman plancha, I believe. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, so they, they work together and ultimately and then pa, or excuse me, Eddie Kingston helped Pac and, uh, hits Brandon Cutler with the, uh, four backward punch, swing punch. Oh, the spinning, the spinning back fist. And, and then, then doing uh, his best Chuck Liddell. And then, uh, uh, so, uh, Pac pinned Brandon Cutler for the win. So, all right, it's good, but it was just, it was like a really overbooked finish here. Um, next up, we see the Pinnacle come out with their limo <laughs> and then they cut a promo in the ring. And each one goes down the line, pretty much saying this whole feud with the inner circle is not done. It's far from over. They talked about Stadium Stampede, how they lost there. I don't know about you, Phil. This is something we talked about, I think, on the car ride as well. How backwards this whole feud's been going. Yeah, this is ass backwards. Look. It's like, like uh, you know, uh, uh, FTR are calling out Santana Ortiz and like saying they want a match. And then they hand the mic to uh, Sean Spears, and he wants more of Sammy Guevara. MJF is standing off to the side. Um, Wardlow grabs the mic, says he wants to take on Jake Hager, and they're going to have a, a, a cage match next week, a MMA-style combat or, match. It's coming Friday. Or it's coming Friday. Yeah, um, I mean, MJF kind of wants Sammy Guevara as well. Yeah, which I was a little confused. Like, Sean Spears wants him, and then MJF, I guess he can't go after Jericho because Jericho really has the injured uh, elbow, right? So he can't plus wrestle. Plus, he says he's already beaten him twice, so there's no need. And yeah, plus, exactly. MJF and, and Sammy never really had a match. So it's interesting. It went from War Games match or Blood and Guts to Stadium Stampede to now the individual matches. It should have been the other way around. should have been the individual matches. Stadium Stampede, and then in on the third match, War Games. Like it's just so yeah. backwards booking this whole rivalry. Like, well, well, I know I'm about to get heat on the internet, but the, you know, the, the I mean, Tony Khan, he's new at this. Vince has forty plus years of experience. I know. And just, while and while and while you say, well, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's a senile old man. L- look at where we are. Go look at Drew and Bobby. That's all I'll say. But I'm just like, I'm, I'm looking at this like, it would have made sense. Like, okay, this is faction versus faction. I'm all for it, but it should have been each guy going up against individually, kind of like their equal counterpart, and then build up the stadium stampede, and then end it on blood and guts, and then have the pinnacle win there, and then they can ultimately be the top faction in AEW. It's going backwards now. Like, I, I just, I'm kind of like losing interest in this rivalry already, so... I don't know, we'll see how it goes. We see the inner circle come out. They destroy the limo. They beat it. You know, they, uh, they, they, they tear it up and, you know, destroy the pinnacles limo there. They, you know, smash it apart, took a forklift to it, flip it over, all that stuff. So, you know, t- typical, you know, fashion of beating up a limo. Like, okay, cool. You know, we saw that. We, we've seen that many times before. Uh, um, next up, it was uh, the TNT title match. It was Miro take on Evil Uno. Another match that was just kind of booked out of nowhere. I mean, Evo- I mean, I, I have kind of more lean, lean, lean way with that because it's a network title. It's on yeah. the TV title level, and back in the day, there would just be random matches for the television championship. So, yeah, I mean, they had a little video package beforehand. Evil Uno, you know, was talking about his friendship with Brody Lee, and he wants the title, get the title back. I think it would have been a little bit better. Maybe that whole video package is saying how much the title means to the whole Dark Order as a whole. And they want to bring it back in honor of Brody Lee. I think that uh, would have made more sense, yes. Yeah, but uh, the match with Miro was okay. You know, Miro was dominating for the most part. Evil Uno got a little comeback in. Dark Order was out there kind of cheering him on, rooting him on. But ultimately, Miro picks up the win and looks very dominant here. I'm, I'm very happy Miro's champion. He's been a monster, credible heel champion. 
And uh, I hope he just keeps winning for a long time. I hope he keeps that title for a long time. So um, next up, we also saw an announcement. Jim Ross is going to sit down with Andrade El Idolo next week. Uh, they had the video package for Andrade. I really enjoyed this video package, how he wants to be the face of AEW. And he's putting on all the jewelry and, you know, the bling bling. Um, he wants to be the face of Latinos. Yeah. I don't know about you, but it's like they should have had this video package air last week teasing his debut and didn't have him debut this past week. Because last week, I know we touched on it briefly, but last week, you know, Vicky Guerrero introduces him, but she's kind of yelling and screeching. You couldn't really understand what she was saying. I think a lot of people at first were like, who is this? And then he comes out with no music, nothing. It was a, it was a very underwhelming debut Ooh. last week. All they had to do was just put El Idolo on the Tron behind those fans. That's all you had to do. I know. We would have known. Yeah. So anyway, it was just this video package. I really enjoyed it. I'm like, okay, I can't wait to see what he talks about next week. But they should have ran this first and then have him debut the following week. That's all I got to say. Next up, Nyla Rose taking on Layla Hirsch. Nyla Rose looks like she's going to be set up as... Uh, Britt Baker's next opponent to challenge for the women's title. Nyla Rose, we saw last week at that segment with Britt Baker's celebration of winning title. She throws all the hamburgers, which I still laugh at that whole segment because it was all like the jobbers in the ring or people that haven't done anything. Um, okay, if you're going to build Nyla Rose to be uh, Britt Baker's next opponent, heel versus heel, I think she should have squashed Layla Hirsch. This match, I think, went on way too long. It went through a picture in picture. I mean, I know Layla Hirsch has been doing really well on Dark and Elevation and stuff, but I think if you want to build up Nyla Rose as this new big monster for Britt Baker to challenge, she should have squashed Layla Hirsch here. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Layla Hirsch, I'm becoming a really big, big fan of hers. Mm-hmm. I mean, she, I think she's, I think she's my age, you know? I mean, she, she came to the States at like 15 from Russia, was an all American standout in, in college and high school for, in, in wrestling. And like, she, she's really coming to her own in the, in the world of professional wrestling. I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with her. Her moonsault that she hit was nice, but yeah, mm-hmm. I do, I do believe she could have suffered. I mean, she was going to lose anyway. It, 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 like, she could have got some quick offense in yeah. and then, and then the big power bomb, like this match shouldn't have been longer than like two minutes. Exactly. Uh, next up, we saw is Tony Schiavone interview Britt Baker, women's champion with Rebel, and they just pretty much called out like Nyla Rose and like you know what her plans are. I, I enjoy uh, anytime Schiavone and Britt Baker are together. It was a lot of fun. Uh, all right, last but not least, main event time: Hangman Adam Page and uh, 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 Preston Vance, or number ten, they, yeah, number ten from the Dark Order, taking on Brian Cage and Powerhouse Hobbs. Uh, fun match, man. Brian Cage, Powerhouse Hobbs, they were working together really well. It was a fun, hard hitting match. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we see some dissension, some more dissension in Team Taz with Ricky Starks trying to throw the uh, FTW title at C- Cage, and Cage is not having it. And Starks like, "Don't touch me! Don't touch me!" because of my neck, and he's running away. Yeah, and um, Hobbs is trying to uh, handle and handle the business, and it's just cool to see one of our own. Uh, on 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 primetime TV like that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's trying to handle his own, but he succumbs to the buckshot lariat. Preston Tan uh, went for the ripcord into a stunner. So Hangman followed with the buckshot lariat, and this allowed Tan to pin Hobbs and grab the victory for the Dark Order. And then they're all celebrating with the beer afterwards. Um, we saw negative one with the water bottle. That was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, no. Brian Cage went running off to chase Ricky Starks. So ultimately, it looks like Brian Cage is going to become a babyface and leave Team Taz, which I guess is good for him. Get away from them. Because unfortunately, I just think Team Taz has not really been doing much to win. Um, but no, overall, hey, it was a good, it was a good happy note to end on with uh, Hangman celebrating with the Dark Order with some beer. So hey, it was a fun, happy ending for this episode of Dynamite. On that note, let's start wrapping things up. Philip, where can the Clixers find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, Heel Antwine, H E E L A N T W I N E, The Bulletcast on Instagram, The Bulletcast on YouTube, at Bulletcast on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, yeah, this is this has been fun, man. This was this was great. Love the Roman discussion. I think that's the best part of the show. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean Roman he is the biggest thing in pro wrestling right now. This whole storyline. Yeah, been you heard that, people. It's <laughs> Roman. It's not your beloved belt collector Kenny Omega. It's not what's going on in Japan. It's the big dog. It's the tribal chief. It's the head of the table. You know why you're allowed to watch professional wrestling? Because Roman lets you. 
<laughs> I'm Baby Huey. Follow me on Facebook at Baby Huey Official, Twitter and Instagram at Baby Huey 83. For everything else, at In The Click on social media, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening to us right now on YouTube, please hit that like button. That helps out with a lot. And please, of course, share the links. Uh, that also helps us out as, as well. Leave a comment, rating, review, all that good stuff. In The Click at gmail.com. Get the merch. The link's in our bio. And on that note, let's go home. And that's the bottom line because Huey said so.